The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Then the Jews started arguing with one another, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They said, Jesus replied, I tell you most solemnly, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in him. As I, who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. This is the bread come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate, they are dead, but anyone who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So we continue in our reflection on this Gospel of John chapter 6. We have been reading from this chapter for the past uh, one, two, this is the third week now, right? And we have been listening to Jesus tell us that he is the bread of life. Yeah? He is the real flesh, the real blood, that if we eat and drink of him, we will have eternal life and he will raise us up on the last day. Now at the beginning of our reflection, two weeks ago, we spoke about how our life should not be purposeless, right? Just a bit of a revision to remember two weeks ago. Our life should not be purposeless and with Jesus in the center of our life, there will be purpose. Yeah. So having faith in Jesus, having a real personal relationship with Jesus that is rooted in the Holy Eucharist especially will help us along that journey of finding purpose. Now we want to be reminded again of that point today and we see us see ourselves being reminded of this in the book of Proverbs, our first reading that talks about wisdom. Wisdom inviting us to eat of her bread, drink of her wine, telling us to leave our foolishness and instead to walk in the ways of perception. Walk in the ways of perception. So now if you are someone who is living in Christ, rooted in Him, just as He mentions in the Gospel today, whereby He says, He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, lives in me, and I live in Him. Now if that is happening, whereby we are living in Jesus and He is living in us, I assure you, my dear brothers and sisters, we will be walking in the ways of perception. So we will be wise in the real sense of the word, not wise in the ways of the world, but wise in the ways of God. Okay, And we know it is God who is the all-wise one. It is He who truly knows the meaning of our existence, the meaning of our life, and especially the purpose of each one of us. Okay, So living in the way of perception. And this is something that is important for us to realize, to not be as though a drunkard. Now imagine if you have been intoxicated before, you lose all control, you lose all sense, proper sense of reality. Okay, how many people have been intoxicated here before? You can raise your hands. Okay, better don't, huh? <laughs> okay, you're awake, you're listening. Do not raise your hands, never mind, it's okay. But if you had that experience, you will know. You lose not only all realization of what's happening, you also lose all control of your life. 
Okay? And that's something that I think nobody really wants. Okay? We don't want to lose control. Isn't that so? Though sometimes we'll find we are swept upon the waves of life. Things are often beyond our control. But the truth is, nobody likes to lose control of themselves. But this is the thing. Most of the time, we will think that we are actually in control. But in fact, we might not be. Yeah? And you need oh, to be a very much perceiving person to realize this. Even being in control of our lives, if you really think about it hard, if you really ask wisdom about it, you will know that in some ways there actually is no such thing. Okay? And we might be experiencing that also. And yet, there is also real control when we are rooted in the things of God because God is master and Lord of everything. He, of course, is in control. Though it seems that the world is spinning out of control most of the time and we ourselves spinning along with it. So my dear brothers and sisters, St. Paul reminds us today in the second reading that we should not be like drunkards, but rather we should be awake, recognizing what is the will of the Lord. Okay, quoting uh, verbatim from the second reading. He says, do not be thoughtless, but recognize what is the will of the Lord. Yeah, so this brings us back again to the idea of discernment, of knowing what is God asking of me in my life, at this particular moment in my day-to-day -day life, at the particular journey of my life that I may be in. Do I know what is God's will for me? What He is inviting me to do? Now, I'm always afraid to talk about God's will because people always have a wrong idea about God's will. They seem to think it's something God has already decided, then I have to try to abide by it. No, God's will is an invitation to you to elicit your free response, to get you to cooperate with Him, and in fact, allowing Him to cooperate with you so that He can do something beautiful with your life. Never something fixed and determined that you just have to bow your head and say, okay, you have decided, I follow. But always an invitation. Okay, just a small thing I have to add in. Because many of us have a wrong understanding of God's will. And when we have a wrong understanding of God's will, we'll think as though we are like just a piece uh, on the chessboard, you know, a pawn and God is just moving us here, there. Right? Then we feel we have lost our freedom. And eventually, we will even spurn God and say, why have I no dignity to make choices in my life? Now, to follow God's will should be a free choice. And everyone here is free to make that choice. And it is truly your decision when you decide to follow His will. Okay, long footnote for that. Because commonly misunderstood. So understand me when I say we must discern what is God's will for us in our life. That is part of living in the ways of perception. That is part of being awake and truly aware of our life. And when we do that, though we may not have control of our life, it will be more of like God is in control. Okay, but not in the negative sense, huh? the sense that he has taken away your free will. Again, I have to put the footnote there because the moment people hear God is in control, they will feel, I, I'm that pawn again. No, <laughs> very dangerous. God is in control because you have offered yourself. This is a big difference. With the freedom of your heart, you say, I trust you, my Lord. That is what it means to put your trust in God. And you trust Him so much because you know why? He is in you and you are in Him. When you reach that point of relationship with God, you are not thinking on it anymore of you are there and I am here. Your will and my will separate. It becomes you and I are here in the one same place. It's not only your will or my will, it becomes 
our will. Uh, that is what it means to become transformed in God. Okay? So hopefully, understanding this, seeking God's will, aligning our will with that will, it changes us into an our will. And truly then, we become collaborators with God. God and us, because of God's humility, at the same level, on par, working together. So how wonderful, how beautiful this thought is, how exalted this thought is, that it escapes the perception of many people. It's just something beyond the comprehension, even of sometimes religious people who want to keep God only in heaven, the all-holy, the untouchable, the, you know, the all-far away, because he is so powerful, so holy, so magnificent, and I'm this little worm. But remember, Jesus Christ, through the mystery of the incarnation, he bridged heaven and earth. Okay? And that's why we Christians have a very different perception of relationship with God. And yes, we are audacious enough to say that we eat and drink the blood, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And through the Eucharist, we are audacious to say, God lives in me and I in him. And this is something that makes us very different from many others who also believe in God, a God that is far away, whom I must obey, who is, yes, omnipotent and all-controlling and everything and all-holy, but I am just that worm. Okay, nobody worms here. Huh? Sons and daughters of God, that is what we are. And that is what we become at baptism. At baptism. So you see how exalted our Christian understanding of the human being, rooted in God as a child of God. This is what we believe. And this is what Jesus Christ came down from heaven to teach us. The way to the Father. Way to the Father because each one of us knows we are indeed sons and daughters. Okay? So beautiful, eh? this whole thought. I hope it helps us to appreciate what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus, and what we believe about our relationship with God. And speaking about this relationship with God, for us Catholics, at the very center of that relationship is the Eucharist. That's why so many weeks now we have been reading John chapter 6 to help us enter into that mystery. Because a Catholic life is nothing other than a Eucharistic life. The Eucharist is the source and the summit of our Christian life. It is the center of our faith. It is the source of what we are. Okay? So that's why for us, believing in the Eucharist, and coming every Sunday to worship God, singing psalms and praise and thanksgiving, participating in the sacrifice of the Mass and receiving the Holy Eucharist. That is so fundamental for us Catholics. And from there, we get the obligation. Revision, a bit of revision. Why the obligation? Because of this great mystery. And it is God's gift to us. Okay. Now, if you saw at the beginning of the Mass, the theme was actually the Eucharist, our thanksgiving. Okay, I would like to end with that point. The Eucharist is a great act of thanksgiving. And what are we giving thanks to God for, if not, first and foremost, being His sons and daughters? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, give thanks to God. You are not a worm. You are a dignified son and daughter of God. Thanksgiving. Every Mass, we thank God for that. For the grace of our baptism. For being chosen to be His sons and daughters. For being living tabernacles. I always like to say that. Temples of the Holy Spirit. All this is cause for us to give thanks. However, Giving thanks is not enough. We want to spread this good news so that others also can come to acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Savior.
can come to know that He is truly the way, the truth, and the life and experience this same blessedness that we are experiencing. And therefore, one day also gather around the table of the Eucharist and give thanks to God for that. So the Eucharist always leads us also to mission. But if we have no thanksgiving in our heart, nothing to be grateful about, and we don't realize what it is that we should be grateful about, we will not have any good news in us to share with others. And that is often the reason why our Catholics do not evangelize. We don't know what is the good news that we are supposed to give to others. So remember, we are not propagating a religion. Okay? Our Catholic faith is beyond that, actually. But we are spreading the good news. Now, if I myself do not know what that good news is, then how am I going to spread it? At the end of the Mass, we are sent on mission. Uh, go. Now, I see, so I'm a bit confused now. What's the word we say? Because there are a few options. Somehow, when we reach the end of the Mass, automatically we will know. No need to look at them. <laughs> okay, there's one of it is go and announce the gospel of the Lord. That's one. Another one is go and uh, go in peace, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Glorifying the Lord by your life. And how do you glorify the Lord by your life? By living a Christ like life. If you are living a Christ like life, people will see the glory of God shining through you, even without you opening your mouth. Because they will see the Jesus who is living in you shining out to the whole world. He becomes really the light of the world and you are his lamp. Yeah? So when the priest says that, and go and glorify, go in peace, glorify the Lord with your life. He's inviting you to move from thanksgiving now to proclamation. And not only just proclaiming, but to service. Not only that, to be, in fact, another Christ for the world. Yes, each and every one of us. We are sons and daughters of Christ, which means we are brothers and sisters of, sons and daughters of God, which means we are brothers and sisters of Christ. And that is what we are supposed to be to the world. And this is where I would like to end my homily today. With the second reading, St. Paul tells us, this may be a wicked age, but your lives should redeem it. Very meaningful statement in second reading. This may be a wicked age, but your lives should redeem it. St. Paul never said, this is a wicked age and the life of Christ will redeem it. Your lives should redeem it. Take this message seriously, dear brothers and sisters. Christ died 2,000 years ago. Now it's your turn and my turn to die. Okay, terrible way to end the homily.